not half as excited about this as I thought you'd be. Oh, hey. So um, this week, we are doing a episode that comes in two parts. A um, episode about costumes and a episode about special effects like blood and gore and missing limbs and stuff like that. Yes, and people missing their entire bodies too. We do that as well somehow. Hello, I'm Claire Tidwell. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for Voices Found, but I also work as an actor and costume designer as well. I've done costume designing in the Milwaukee area for several years now, but I got my start with Voices Found at the end of season one when I was cast in Richard III. Um, I started off as acting, eventually got more involved with different events, and have been brought on as a board member and costume designer, and I've done several productions um, with Voices Found since. Today I'm going to be talking about the process that I take when costume designing, especially for such a unique concept for Hamlet. So the very first thing I need to take into consideration is the text. Um, just like any other designer before in build a Bard will tell you, is that you need to read it. Read it, read it, read it. I will read a text multiple times, making sure that I'm reading the correct version, that it, we're all reading the same story, um, and making sure that it's being read with a clean slate as well. Making sure that I'm not thinking of the other production I did, who else has done things like this, um, and other things that can influence me. Making sure that I'm really just looking at the text first, and then I can go through with a more critical lens, looking for the things that I need to. The different things that I look for are the action of the play, who's entering, who's exiting, what fights are happening, who needs to move how, um, and other things to keep in, in, in consideration for that. The other thing are clues that the text is going to have for how a, a character needs to dress. So this is going to be looking at the status of different characters. Um, you know, Hamlet is going to, you know, look a, a, extremely different than Polonius, who's going to look different than um, the Fortinbras, you know, all those different things to keep in mind of who's going to look different. Um, and that's usually the, the bigger indicators. Before I come even approach a, uh, a production team, uh, I've usually read the script many, many times and have many different ideas. And that can completely change when we all get together for the first time. When you first get together as a production team, everyone has marinated with the text in their own sense. We all have our own ideas of how, of what, you know, a fifth century Viking looks like and it's not until we get together that we finally have the conversations to figure out how exactly we're going to portray that um, and get the, the, the director's message across. How do you, you know, how do you for $200 dress an entire team that is going to complement the set's idea while getting, you know, across the idea of, you know, the, the gritty world that is, you know, the Vikings live in, this idea of toxic masculinity, and how am I going to portray that without overstepping what the set, or, the set designer is trying to get across, um, making sure that things aren't conflicting and, um, you know, muddling up the, the story that we're trying to tell. That's the big, the big key thing is um, making sure that you're all telling the same story. As a costume designer, I have a personal philosophy that um, if you are not comfortable in your costume, you are not acting. Um, costumes are a tool. They're oftentimes, I think, is the final tool that an actor needs in order to finally put the polish to finally bring that character forward. Um, you could spend hours and hours with your text and really understand what you're saying and, you know, be, been able to walk through your set and stand in that light. But that moment you put on that last jacket piece, the moment you put on that last streak of makeup, you just, you feel 
like that character. And when those words come out of your mouth and being able to, to feel through it, it's just, it's something phenomenal and it really makes the difference for, for actors. So as a costume designer, I need to make sure that that character that actor is comfortable in what they're wearing in order to portray their character. If you're an actor and you're constantly adjusting your costumes and fixing your hair and your makeup is bleeding into your eyes, you're not going to be able to act correctly. You're not going to be able to, to give it your full to bring to light the, the text. So making sure that I am carefully looking at the text communicating with the actors and with the director and the fight choreographer to make sure that everyone is comfortable and safe. So once you have, you know, the ideas put together, making sure that you've had that conversation with your director, what what are the key elements? What are you trying to get to get across? It's like, yes, it's great that they're Vikings, but what kind of Vikings are they? For this particular concept, um, you know, the the directors decided that, you know, they want to focus in on the great heathen army, um, you know, of the of the the early Danish Vikings and what exactly that means, because that's going to be way different than, you know, the full northern Scandinavian army um, or or Vikings or the ones who were, you know, sailing and, and discovering the Americas all completely different all different you know the ways that they dress the ways that they fight is all going to be different so making sure especially as a as a as a costumer and if we if historical accuracy uh is important to telling the story making sure i have that um because you know like if i have one actor who's dressed in you know the the full fur cloaks that is you know the high status of like the northern armies um versus you know like the danish armies who were more like leather and you know other things like that how am i going to simulate that in my costumes um and uh, so that there's not a confusion that people aren't on the same playing field. And so occasionally if you get that huge person or that ver- that stickler in the audience who's seen Vikings, you know, one too many times, that they're not going to be drawn out of the, the conversation you're having on stage as an actor to your audience um, because of historical and weird inaccuracies. Unless you are, of course, going for more stylized Uh, concept it's viking inspired as opposed to we want this to be the great heathen army so keeping that in mind so there's actually a ton of research that goes into um working as a costume designer a lot of my um a lot of my work is spent on pinterest and the internet my day job i'm a librarian so i love to research i love looking at historical um things so a lot of it is a mix of you know previous productions so in this case looking at um you know the history channels vikings um or you know other bbc productions on what you know their portrayal of what vikings are but then also making sure that you have you know like artist renditions artist renditions of the early periods um looking at um a lot of historical artifacts as well uh, if, you know, I need a, a character to be of high status, what kind of like jewelry would the high status women wear? Um, how would they have their hair? What, what are the important things? What's the important imagery to the Vikings? Um, you know, looking at all of the, the filigree, what's an artist interpretation on Etsy versus, you know, what they actually carved into their boats of the time or what did their shields look like? Um, is is um do they have a runic culture is that important to them and how would they you know incorporate that into their armors when they're going into battle or what what other you know things are of significance to them as as a culture what shows off that they are a person of status what shows off that they are a, a gilded warrior type thing um and that's really going to help with the historical accuracies um so again looking at how other people have done it in the past um i think it's always great to look at larpers and see what they've done a lot of a lot of people who are really into live action role playing have done the the historical research they know what they're looking for they know that their uh costumes are are historically accurate um but again making sure that it's all telling the same story 
after I've put together all of my historical pieces and have an idea of what I want to do, whether I've scratched, sketched it out or I've started building it just from what I can find, um, that's when I start building in earnest um, with the help of my lovely costume assistant here. Um, as a one-person crew, I usually have to figure out how to budget my time in order to build everything I need to, upcycle what I have to, to in order to tell the story that I need to all before, um, all before tech. Once tech rolls around, we usually begin with a costume parade, which is basically, hey actor, here's your costume for this character, put it on and walk in front of the, the the director. I stand next to the director. We have a conversation. Yes, that's correct. Hey, that's missing. Didn't you say you were going to? Making sure that the actor knows exactly what they're wearing, when they're wearing it, um, and it's their last chance to basically to tell me what's right, what's wrong um, with the comfort of their costume and making sure that that conversation stays in, in flux while we go through tech, um, through the first and second dress rehearsal, and then making sure everything is nailed down and perfect to go for that final dress. Um, in full hair, full makeup, um, and making sure that everything is run smoothly. Everyone knows where their quick changes are and, uh, and finishing out strong. So that when opening night comes around, the only thing I have to do is maybe come in to do some laundry and sew on a button. So... <laughs> So that's the quick process on how to go about creating a, a very, very specific costume design and thinking of the historics of what you want to tell. Um, and it all comes down to those tiny details, but communication is key and making sure that your actors are comfortable and safe all while telling your story. Boo. <laughs> Hi, just kidding. Um... So my name is Brittany Hout, and today we are going to be talking about stage makeup and special effects. So I've been working with VFR in several capacities since 2016. I have been an actor for some time. I also serve as a board member for them, and I've had the distinct pleasure of designing special effects for a couple of their productions. Uh, those productions would be Titus Andronicus and Medea. I've also designed kind of just unofficial capacity blood effects for myself for the Scottish play and some other, you know, small things here and there, such as scars or, you know, dark eyes and whatnot. Um, I got started back in 2013. Back in college, I took a stage makeup class. And since then, I've been largely self-taught. I've had a lot of trial and error, a lot of learning from my peers on the internet. And I've just kind of grown from there. So when it comes to stage makeup, Voices Found usually has a lot of cast members doubling, sometimes even tripling roles. So conversations about characterizations and time to change and transitions, um, those are the things that be part of my sit downs with actors, the directors, and the costume designer too. Uh, most actors would likely just have, uh, you know, standard stage makeup base. I don't want their face to wash out. We want to see their eyes, their lips things like that, um, as well as, you know, any other constants we decide on in the universe. So if you really want everyone to have thick eyeliner, uh, then a lot of people will likely have that. Now, when it comes to special effects moments, we want to start with establishing where we can enhance the story without becoming a spectacle in the bad way and kind of drawing away from it. Uh, for Hamlet, an example, the use of blood can be very powerful. Uh, with the driving force of the story being Hamlet seeking vengeance for the death of his father, spoiler alert, um, finally seeing blood can really signal the reality of the decisions he's starting to make and things he's been grappling with. And when it comes to stuff like this, collaboration with the fight director and the uh, costume designer is absolutely essential. When it comes to what you're making your blood pack or your squib out of, it's very important that you ensure it does not stain uh, the set or the clothing, and that it won't cause any allergic reactions or issues for your actors. If you have the budget, uh, purchasing a pre-made blood product might be the best bet. It's a little easier. I've personally worked with Gravity and Momentum's Blood Jam. It's very washable. You can mix it to whatever consistency you need. Um, and it just works very well in that capacity. Um, plastic sandwich baggies. 
work great for squibs. Uh, really, you just kind of fill the corner of them, twist it off, kind of cut the excess, and the seams rip very easily. <laughs> um, if you don't have the budget for blood, um, there's tons, tons of recipes on the internet. Uh, again, making sure that what you choose is not going to cause any adverse effects for your actors or any of the properties that you're working with, including costumes. Um, but my favorite go-to mixture is dish soap and kids washable poster paint. I buy them in red and blue and I mix them together until I get the color I want. It usually looks really good in stage light, but of course if you're going to have edible blood, you're going to have something in someone's mouth, you really need to make sure that whatever recipe you choose is edible. So moving on, Hamlet also presents us with other opportunities outside of squibs to kind of show damage and try and enhance the stakes in the story or the consequences. Um, blood powder is another product that can be utilized to great effect, uh, for example, in that dual scene. Uh, blood powder it comes in many different um, brands, relatively inexpensive. It is a translucent powder. Um, that when water is applied to it suddenly becomes red. So this is something that depending on the weapons being used, depending on whether or not it can be safely done or no damage to the weapons, um, that would be very effective. Um, we can also look at things such as the use of Alka-Seltzer for the poisoning. A chewed up Alka-Seltzer tablet really is effective at creating a foaming effect. But again there, <laughs> make sure that you get something like an antacid version instead of an aspirin version. So you really don't want to have any adverse effects for your actors. Um, but there are a lot of great options to add some realism um, and drama to our production. Um, it's just important to remember that it should always be in service of your story. So thank you so much for joining us this week for Build a Bard. If you like what you see um, and you want to see what we've discussed previously, please check out our YouTube channel or our playlist on Facebook. And if you have any questions or anything you'd like us to cover, please let us know in the comments. We'll see you next week.